Hi everybody, welcome to our Topo 2 Q&A. We have our Escapod engineers here. Hi everybody, I'm Adam. I am the lead engineer and also the design engineer. Uh, hi, I'm Hal. I'm the, uh, the second design engineer here at Escapod. Jen will be joining us in just a second, but we wanted to get started. So first kind of topic that we're going to have some questions from is going to be timeline for Topo 2. So the first one we have is when is Topo 2 production going to be beginning? When are people going to start seeing their trailers? Starting off with a hard one. Yeah, I'm um, sorry. <laughs> so the date that that the first customer trailer will, will enter the main line is May 30th. Um, right now, we consider production to have already started because we have 10 frames welded up and sent to galvanization. Um, we have parts on the CNC cut for customer trailers. So we consider it started, but as far as a customer trailer on the main line, we're, we're shooting for May 30th. Perfect. Can you talk a little bit about um, what you guys have been working on for the past couple weeks in regards to the prototypes and things like that? Sure. Um, so we have been working on the second and the third pre-production models of the Topo 2. So we're calling it Beta and Charlie. Beta, we have taken to a very good point and then had to pause because Charlie started and is going to be shown at Overland West. And so that has become our priority. And so we have a whole R&D team working rigorously right now on on charlie perfect thank you uh jen has joined us so she's gonna hop on in and we'll continue on to Very the awkwardly. next question <laughs> sorry i'm late okay so our second question is what is the anticipated production time for a top of two from start to finish so kind of what it looks like when it enters the main shop, how long is it going to take for it to finish up and be ready for pickup? So the production schedule in that sense um, is going to be a, a kind of ramping schedule. So we're going to start off a lot slower than we'll finish this calendar year. Um, at first, we're probably going to be looking at I don't know, 16 days from start to finish for the first little while. And then we'll slowly get that down to about an eight day production schedule. Um, but that's going to be a staggered eight day. So one day at a time, um, one trailer at a time. Awesome. So that's all we had for timeline. We did I would couple. like, I would like to add Perfect. to the kind of the production speed. Cause we talk about it, um, in a couple different ways. And I think what gets communicated out to customers, um, sometimes gets a little bit confusing. So for example, like Ford, um, a, f a new F-150 leaves Ford's production line every 54 seconds or something like that. That's when we learned. That doesn't mean it takes 54 seconds to build a Ford, obviously. Um, so I guess my point in saying that is when Hal is speaking to, you know, eight days from start to finish, that would also, um, it doesn't mean that it takes eight days between uh, completing a single trailer. Mm. We have multiple trailers in progress at once. So by the end of the year, we will be at, at least at a one a day cadence with um, Topo 2, which is the cadence that we're currently at with the original Topo. Um, so the, the production assembly will start and takes, you know, it spends a day in each bay for eight days, but um, by the end of the year, producing one Topo 2 a day. Right. And that is in the in the main line as well. So there will be a whole building that's devoted to building your sub assemblies of Topo 2, and that's not included in this eight days because they will work as their own entity, completing those sub assemblies and stocking them. Awesome. Anything else to add to timeline? I don't think so. Okay. Well, <laughs> let's move on to the features section. We had a couple uh, customers want um, some details on some of the features of Topo 2. So we'll start off with a little bit of a fun one. Can you guys tell me what your favorite feature of Topo 2 is? Sure, yeah. I, I think each of us should answer this, but uh, my personal favorite from an engineering standpoint is the, the monocoque body um, that we spent so many hours on the design 
and went through, okay, what if the sidewall is one panel and the other sidewall is a panel and the roof is a panel and the tongue box is separate? And it, we're really proud that we achieved one monocoque body that we then fit over everything and is assembled. So that's my favorite feature from a user standpoint. We just got the shower up and going and that is looking really cool. I'd say my favorite feature of the Topo 2 is the integrated heating system, the um, air heater and the water heater together. I'm a total wimp when it comes to the cold. And so being able to have such a cool heater and be able to camp year round and be as warm as you could ever want to be is a really neat feature. Um, I was actually also going to talk about heat because I, I never, I've never, until Tapo 2, I've never camped in a teardrop trailer that had heat. Um, and I kind of thought that it wasn't really something that you needed and arguably it's not something you need. However, it is very nice to have, um, especially when camping with a toddler, camping with kids, it's really great to be able to kind of set the thermostat um, to a certain setting before you crawl into bed at night. Um, but then I, I also have two other ones. Um, <laughs> the mud room is an amazing feature. Um, it's such a simple little innovation, but truly like the question of where to put your shoes or where do I put my bulky jacket, um, when you get into a teardrop, it's, it's, it's solved finally. Um, so I love the mud room and the, the interior cabin space of the Tapo 2 is just so spacious and airy. Um, and I love being in there, even though this product is really designed to, um, you know, allow you to optimize your time spent in the outdoors. Um, it really still makes you feel connected to the outdoors when you're inside the trailer as well. Yeah. One of my talking about the heating, um, <laughs> my favorite thing about the heating is the two overhead vents. They, they, uh, output the heat right over the like, stargazer. So it creates this curtain of heat over the stargazer, which will help with, uh, condensation on the stargazer. Zero condensation in the top of two. I mean, we have camped in like very, very cold weather, 10 degree weather, and we have running water and no condensation. Like it is, it's the, if you've camped in cold weather in a teardrop, you know about condensation. If you've camped in cold weather in anything, you know about condensation. And that was truly mind blowing for yeah, us. We were it's like, pretty oh. awesome. It worked. <laughs> One more point on the heat as well is the entire cabin is heated. Um, so that includes your electrical cabinet, that includes your water tank, includes the cabinet underneath your sink. Um, so not only will you be warm, all of your electronics will be warm, your water will, I won't say your water will be warm, but your water won't freeze when you have the heater running. So it really opens the door for a lot more camping potential. I also wanted to add my favorite feature, you just mentioned it in um, your description about the, the condensation, but I love the Stargazer. The Stargazer in the original Tapo is already one of my favorite features because I feel like looking at the stars is the best part of camping and having a you know triple sized <laughs> stargazer just makes that even better it opens up I, I think it just adds a lot to um to the experience it makes it feel so much larger inside and uh you can see more of the stars yeah sitting in the topo too is like this very open feeling and I, it feels just like a homey space pod in my mind <laughs> <laughs> homey space pod. yeah i really like that <laughs> Any other favorite features to add? Feeling good? Cool. I mean, we could. Yeah, we can go all the time. All the time. <laughs> the size of the doors, the side doors, and those windows, that also adds to that spacious feeling. The large stargazer and the large windows on each side, and just the additional space with the body going over the fenders. Mm -hmm. Yeah it makes a big difference. And another engineering feature of the gutters, just oh, trapping yeah. all the water. Totally. So. All good things, we could go on for hours. All good things. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll move on to the next question. What does the design process kind of look like for new products coming down the pipeline at Escapod, or what's that process kind of look like from an engineering standpoint? Yeah, for sure. Um, so I don't know if the viewer was referring to like an add-on that would be newly designed that would go into Topo 2 or a new trailer concept in general, but it's kind of the same process for both. Um, it starts with, you know, the conception of the idea and brainstorming and ideation, trying to think of 
as many possibilities and solutions to try to solve what what the problem is ultimately. And then from there, you know, you, you rule things out based on, is it manufacturable? Is it aesthetic? Things like that. And you kind of start narrowing it down and then you would hit the uh, 3D modeling of it and just come up with a very like low fidelity model just to see if that would work and if it achieves everything that we're looking for. And then from there, it's working into a higher fidelity model Make, maybe we do some rapid prototyping, some 3D printing of the idea. Um, and, and like I said, that's true for a new trailer. Like when we started the Topo 2 design, we 3D printed like a 1 to 32 <laughs> baby Topo 2. Um, so that's the general process. And then from there, it's more advanced prototyping. Maybe we machine things out of HDPE and then start implementing it and testing. And the design process is really not a linear process. It's very circular. So maybe we'll come back to ideating on an idea and adding a new feature. So it's never, especially for us, it's never <laughs> at the finish line. We're always trying to make improvements. Awesome. Um, how is the Topo 2 different from other fiberglass trailers? So we're really, really proud of the fiberglass uh, body and entirely fi fiberglass trailer that we have put together. Um, some of the things that make Topo 2 special are the fact that it is an entirely fiberglass build. We have no structure in our trailer that is not part of our fiberglass mold. So typically in a lot, in a lot of fiberglass trailers that you would have seen, you have a fiberglass shell that you put over a structural um, frame. And we ha have all of our structure built into our design. So it is one fiberglass body. We put it over our galley, and that's, that's how we build our trailer. Um, and speaking of our body, we are really happy we were able to engineer it in a way that we could make it as a one-piece mold. We have no seams that can shake apart or let water in. We were able to make a really, really beautiful design out of one mold, and it um, makes a lot of things possible for us. Perfect. Uh, what is the departure angle of Topo 2? 32.6, something like that. Around 33 degrees. Yeah. Which, as a, an anecdote, is only a few degrees less than a Jeep Wrangler. Perfect. That works for me. That was an easy one. <laughs> that was an easy one. Yay! Short, to the point, I like it. <laughs> Uh, can anyone speak to the battery life without an AC unit on top of two? I know it's kind of a little new, but any ideas on that? Yeah, so we were talking about that one earlier. Um, the idea and the hope from our end for the customer is that they can be out on a, you know, partially sunny day and not have to worry about the battery. So that's kind of been our goal with the, with the Topo 2. And the, and the enlarged solar panel, so, which comes standard. I could say something on that too. Yeah, of um, just to, as one example, we forgot to charge up Topo 2 when we went to Sea Otter and we thought, oh man, I don't know how fast that solar <laughs> panel is gonna get it charged up. And we didn't time it or anything, but it was fully charged in almost no time with that um, 140 watt solar panel. So that's a really nice standard feature. Yeah. yeah. It was within a day that the the lithium battery went from like, the readout I think was at like 10.6, which is like about as dead as you can get yeah. on that battery. And <laughs> really? um, it, moment. <laughs> yeah, it was charged up to full charge at 12 point, I think full charge is 12.8 to like 13.2 or something like mm -hmm. that. And we were up to 12.8 within a few hours and then right. by the next day completely completely charged just on solar alone so that was fantastic and That's that was for awesome. a single battery with the 140 but um yeah i mean it, it works really well and from our experience so far it has been able to like self-generate like we use the battery throughout the day and then by the time you know a full day passes like you've charged up again so it hasn't really felt like uh limited at this point but um our build hasn't had anything that's like hugely um energy sucking on it either uh, mostly like device charging and that sort of thing but when we're camping that's 
kind of the limit of it for us. So. Yeah, battery life in a trailer like this is going to depend so much on what you're doing, what your usage looks like, what the sky looks like, um, you know, what time of year it is. So it's, it's really difficult to put a number on it, um, but it should be plenty for anybody uh, that's out there. Unless you're running a blender all day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And Full on coffee maker. Yeah. yeah. Jen touched on it. There isn't a ton in the trailer that draws a, a very much power. It's really just uh, phone chargers and running the electronics that monitor your trailer for you. The, heat, the water heater and the air heater is a uh, propane furnace, so it doesn't draw your electricity when you're heating water or heating your air. And the rest is just low power LEDs and um, USB ports, basically. Nice. Uh, can the trailer be used year round as a mobile home? Is it all seasons? Yeah, so that one I would say is a bit tricky. Um, the short answer is yes, um, but you definitely need to make sure to take precautions against freezing the plumbing system up. Um, and that really comes down to making sure, so basically it's, it, there's heat transfer going on between your warm camper and, or trailer and the ambient temperature of the environment. And at a certain point, if you aren't running any heat in your trailer, your trailer will get to the ambient temperature of the environment. Now we've put insulation in our shell and, and done some things to guard against that and to slow that that transition down. Um, but it, it does depend on a lot of things that are a bit tricky to answer. I do want to add to that because I think that's the very responsible engineering answer, which is why we have engineers and then we have just real people that use things. <laughs> hey, we're um, real people. I mean, no. <laughs> they're what real the people hell? too. Um, but like, so to Adam's point, pipes can freeze if the pipes get below freezing. Yes. Um, most trailers, most RVs, those water lines are going to be running like on the outside or through some part of the trailer that doesn't have heat directly to it. Um, as Hal mentioned earlier, all of our water system and all of the plumbing is within that heated compartment. Um, so, you know, if you're camping and you're using your trailer, you're probably not going to let the inside of your trailer get down below freezing. Um, but yeah, if you're going to store your trailer for a long period of time, um, then you're going to want to make sure, and it's outside and it's going to be below freezing for an extended period of time, then yes, like your house is the same way. If you leave your house and you don't keep the heat on in the winter, your pipes can freeze in your house. So that's kind of where, yeah, you need to be paying attention and mindful of it in a real use case. Like this was designed to be a four season camper. Um, it's intended for year round use. We hope you get out and use it in the winter because nobody else will and you'll have the whole place to yourself. So um, totally. it can be chilly, but fun. And we've done specific efforts to, to, you know, split off a ducting run and run it straight to where the water tank is and to where the water pump is. So we're not, it's not only within the heated escapod, it's actively seeing heat from our, our air heater. And then I also want to say that it would be really neat to do some field testing on these sort of things to say, like, you could leave your trailer out in zero degree weather for six hours until, mm -hmm. until things freeze up, things like yeah. that. So that would be really cool to do one day. Marcus words, folks. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all we have for features. So we're going to go into some questions about customizations. So first one up, uh, a customer reached out and said, I have a Jeep Rubicon. Can I get the Topo 2 in the same color as my Jeep? It's in the color Crazy Pearl. Crazy Pearl sounds pretty. Um, the short answer is no. The longer answer is uh, it might be something that we would consider at some point down the line. Um, right now, we don't have an option for um, custom colors. Uh, it's it, it's within the realm of possibilities for you know a certain amount of um, additional cost. Uh, the reason we have opted against that right now is just from a, a streamlining of the production flow, um, and and any kind of customization just requires uh, more specific timing, uh, which can then have other impacts on the production line. So right now we're just kind of keeping it simple with the standard options, um, and it's possible we'll reevaluate 
down the line, but right now we cannot do a crazy pearl color. Sorry. Unfortunate. Yeah. <laughs> I would say though that if you call in and talk to our salespeople, they will help you pick out the perfect color to match your trailer. Yeah. Or your car, sorry. <laughs> Jeep. Your Jeep, it's not a car. <laughs> perfect. Um, so another question we got is, my wife is short and worried about the cabin entry height and the sink height. Is there a possibility to make Topo 2 shorter? Yeah, so th this we've been kind of toying with in the in the back of our minds um, and knowing that it will be an issue for some people um, since Topo 2 started and a while back last year at some point I came up with a concept of this swinging step stool that basically is the whole area behind the galley um, and that just got paused at, at concept because there were more pressing things going on but I would love to bring it back and hopefully that that could be an add-on one day that's just a bolt-on to the frame and you'd be able to swing a, a step down. So no right now, hopefully one day in the future. Um, the other addition there just in terms of like usability of, of the trailer, I think for someone who is on the shorter side, um, the stove position is going to be still really comfortable to use, which was one area that we wanted to make sure we got into a, a, a usable height, um, given that there's a flame and, you know, we don't want people catching on fire. Um, so that will still be excellent. Now getting in and out of the trailer, um, I travel with a collapsible step stool. I'm, I'm tall and I still find it convenient to have it just for, for multiple different purposes, not just accessing things in the galley or getting in and out of the um, pod. Uh, but that is something to consider in the meantime until we have um, a more fleshed out, like integrated solution. Uh, any way of switching the hub to a Wrangler 5x5 bolt pattern so you only have to carry one spare? I would not say there's any way we will be switching hubs um, to match different wheel sets. What the best option is most likely to get, a, um, get an adapter from our hub size to your hub size and then you can run whatever wheels and tire set that you would like. So is the 200 amp hour of the battery the max you can upgrade it to? Are you able to add any battery to the front box? So it is right now. Um, that again would also be something that, you know, based on customer feedback, your guys' feedback that we would be open into looking into. Awesome. Uh, do the upgraded tires add more height to the top of two? Uh, they should not. The upgraded tires are the same size tire as the um, standard ones. Based on slightly different tread patterns, you might see a very small variance, but the tires are the same size. It should be roughly the same height. Perfect. Okay, so those are all the questions that we had pre-submitted. Did have a couple come through. Pop um, quiz. Pop quiz time. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, the first one that came through is why not offer a bat wing type awning? Um, so the one a 180 awning is something that in the very near future we will have available as an option. Um, the reason that we have not done a 270 is because we just haven't found it to be the most usable. Um, feature with our trailer given the height of the hatch once you open it. So to use a 270 you would swing that additional 90 degree corner around the front tongue box which um, you could do. Um, that just really comes down to uh, prioritizing our shelf space to be perfectly honest. Um, every new option that we add to our lineup um, competes with other products. Uh, our inventory, especially through COVID and dealing with supply chain constraints and delays, has meant that we have to increase our lead time and sometimes we have to have months worth of things on our shelf, which is a nauseating thing from a, a business management perspective, um, but something that we do so that you guys can get your trailers on time. Um, so trying to kind of limit those things that we know people are able to get aftermarket. Sometimes we're just like this they can get one, they can put it on. Every trailer comes with crossbars. Every trailer has the capability of attaching an awning. Um, so it's something you can do after market, but we just haven't prioritized in terms of that shelf space constraint. 
Uh, if it's all one piece, how do you access the galley in Taco 2? So maybe just a little bit of... Mm, that's a good question. <laughs> um, yeah, so when I say the body is one piece, basically imagine the entire trailer and then the floor cut out of it. So there's still a floor piece and then what we're calling the body. Um, and so each of those are two pieces and then we build the galley and then install the body over that and bond it all together. Um, and we have a really strong structural adhesive. And then when he's referring to the body, so the body would include, uh, does not include the hatch door and the tongue box door. Right. Um, those are separate pieces that are then um, installed kind of in the build process. So there's still a hatch that opens up on the top O2 uh, to access the galley. Yes. Awesome. Do you have an estimate of how many days you think someone could be out on a trip and have enough battery to keep them out there? Hmm. Depends uh, on sunshine. True. And depends on how much you're using, you know, your, the power in your trailer. Um, I think that this system, if you are, are truly only charging like a, your cell phone when you're out, uh, that with the 140 watt solar panel, it's pretty much going to be able to run indefinitely. Things that are going to use the most power will be if you leave your lights on for a really long time, um, if you're running your fan for an extended period of time. Uh, the lights we found you only use for a couple hours um, in the evening. You don't need them at all during the day because there's so much natural sunlight. Um, and then the fan is the other thing in the in the heat of the summer that you'll be running uh, for an extended period of time, like eight hours overnight. Even still with this setup, I think that with the 140 watt panel, you would even in like not full sun, you'd, you'd be pretty okay for a while. Um, that said, depending on usage, it could be as short as two to three days, depending on what you're charging. Um, you put an AC on this, that's going to come down to like three hours and you're going to want a backup generator with you to keep that thing going. Perfect. We had uh, another customer come and ask about custom colors. Do you want to just explain that one more time? Yeah, so just um, custom colors are not something we're offering right now uh, as we're getting the Topo 2 line up and running and just kind of working through the initial unforeseen challenges that come with setting up a new production line for any product. Um, but it is, you know, it's auto grade paint. Um, it's possible to match to a specific color. So there might be something coming down the line for that, but it's not something that we have entertained just yet. Perfect. Well, last call for questions while we wait to see if any come through. Is there anything you guys would like to add? Um, I don't think so. <laughs> I want to, I want to add, I want to ask questions. Can I ask questions? Please. Yeah. Um, so I would just like to know, um, what your favorite and least favorite part of, um, bringing Topo 2 to life has been. That's a good question. <laughs> um, Pop quiz time. I think it's, I mean, for me, I kind of have a, a personal attachment to that question, I think, because it's, I, I started with Escapod when Topo 2 was in that conception phase of the design process and now walking out into two new buildings and seeing like three of these Topo 2s coming alive is like pretty mind blowing and let alone in a few weeks when the production line's getting going. Um, so yeah, I guess just seeing the whole process for me has been my favorite. Um, and my, we have to figure out this plumbing system and there's a British, uh, thread count on the mixer and we have to get this adapter and it's like things that come up that are also fun in their own way, but it's more like type two fun, run yeah. to the store and, and frantically do it. Tedious. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. I would say my favorite part has been seeing all the different aspects of what brings a product like this together. Um, this has been my first engineering job since I graduated college. And so being in a real, real world situation and seeing all the pieces that have to come together to make something like this work has been really interesting. I've also just enjoyed how much I've gotten to learn and how many different experiences I've gotten to get uh, through this design process and bringing this product to life. I think my least favorite part kind of would piggyback off of Adam's, which is just the 
the hectic nature of what we're trying to do here, the stress involved with getting things done in a, um, in a very uh, high quality sort of way, not just trying to piece things together, but trying to piece things together in, a, um, an, except, in an exceptional way has been really difficult, but also really re rewarding. We did have a couple more questions come in. <laughs> Uh, first one, I noticed something called EchoSpec on the website. What is that? So remember when I, a second ago I was talking about the high quality nature of what we're trying to do? <laughs> that, that is, that is EchoSpec coming through. Um, EchoSpec is named after one of Escapod's business partners, Chris Echol. Um, he joined uh, Escapod in 2018. And I mean, he was involved in the company from the very beginning in, in helping us with our design. Um, Chris Hudak, my husband, and Chris Eckel uh, went to college together at Ohio State. They were on the crew team. Um, <laughs> and Eckel's background is in design. He did UX design for Bloomberg. I think that was his, his last role that he was in before coming out here and doing Escapod full time. But with that came a, a really particular way of evaluating design and fit and finish and how pieces come together and you know like things like valves and fittings and faucets and shower heads like there are details that uh we aren't just throwing whatever is cheap onto a trailer on either of our trailers on any of our trailers um, and echo spec really just speaks to um, paying attention like having um, and attention to detail, to caring about those finer things and making sure that you're not just thinking about how to get the job done, but how to get the job done well. Yeah, I think EchoSpec is really valuing both form and function mm -hmm. and not letting anything go that's checking only one of those boxes. It, it needs to work really well and be really beautiful. Totally. Yeah, I have a funny Echol Spec story. And it, it kind of started off as a joke, the whole Echol Spec thing, but now it's really turned into like something that we pride ourselves on. Um, but with the mat in the tongue box, I remember when we first had it designed and we were like, oh, how, like what is the pattern going to be on it? And I went to like my notebook. We also asked Echol and I went to my notebook and I was like, I'm going to be Echol and like come up <laughs> with this really cool thing. And he comes out with this really like elaborate topo lined t uh, tongue box mat with like the propane outlined and mine were just like looked terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Another question that came through from a first timer at our Q&A. Welcome. Oh, welcome. Um, they want to know what the best part of working at Escapot is. I'm biased. I can't answer. <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> okay, I will answer. Um, being one of the founders and owners, um, okay, I'll try not to cry because I tend to be a crier. Um, it has, oh, I'm not going to be able to not cry. It's humbling on a daily basis um, to have seen the company grow as much as it had. And oh my God, I'm so bad at that. <laughs> Um, it's crazy and it's like it's because of you guys it's because of you watching and it's also because of guys like Hal and Adam and people like Jess and Victoria behind the lens um, we're so lucky to have built such an amazing team that cares so much about not only the product that we're creating but um, the experiences that we're trying to provide so that's my favorite part I'm gonna stop Jay. talking <laughs> you're gonna make me cry too before I embarrass myself further but that's what I love and why um, yeah, why we continue to do this because it's not it's not always easy. These guys have been busting their butts for months. Bringing this product to life has been uh, a big challenge in ways we couldn't have imagined, and they're doing an amazing job. And Jess and Victoria are doing an amazing job. Everybody's doing amazing. Um, so yeah, I'm done. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, the the people here and and the culture. It's a it's cool to see the team come together and have customer service and their input and and operations and that whole web that we have to, to navigate through. And yeah, just seeing all of the different components of the total Escapod team coming together is pretty awesome. I think for me, it's been so many new things all of the time, um, both seeing them come to life, going from concept of Topo 2 and planning the launch and then seeing a real life Topo 2, 
things like that are pretty incredible. And then we always have new initiatives and new programs and new things. You know, it's just a constant, uh, constantly evolving company that's always getting better and always growing. And that has been really rewarding to, to try to contribute to that and feeling like I'm learning something new all the time and just growing as a person with all the people around me that bring different skills to the table. Yeah, um, I would like to piggyback off of what Victoria was just saying is all of the different experiences that you get working at this company are amazing. And from an engineering standpoint, you know, we as engineers, we don't just get to design one product and that's what we do with our time. We get to design tools and we get to design processes and we get to design so many different products. And then not only do the, the, the design, we get to prototype and test and see everything come together from start to finish. And I think that's a somewhat unique role as to find yourself in as an engineer. Um, it's not convoluted. It's not, uh, our roles aren't drowned out. We all get to do so many different things and see so many things happen. It's pretty awesome. I'll wrap it up with my answer, I guess. Um, I've never worked in a job where I was challenged as much as I am here at Escapod, but that's been incredibly rewarding and to basically have the camaraderie of all the teams and we're all working through big things together. We all listen to what all the other departments are struggling with and we all come together to try and make it work and that's just been really satisfying to be a part of. And there isn't a day that I don't walk out in the shop and someone makes me laugh <laughs> or <laughs> says something really nice to me. And it's just been something that's really brightened my life and has been a really good fit for me. So Escapod's been great. Thank you, guys. Yeah. I don't have any other questions that have come through. Anything else that you guys want to finish up on or tie it all up in a pretty bow? Um, I hope you guys are getting excited. Yeah, they're they're about ready to roll out. Yep. Yeah. Thanks for asking your questions. It's fun to talk about something that we've spent so much time working on and put so much effort into. Ah, I guess I'll say something. To <laughs> <laughs> um, just to echo these guys, thank you for showing up. Thanks for submitting questions and thanks for your continued support uh, of Escapod and of everything that this team is doing. <laughs>